Hello. Hi guys, how are you? Good. Happy to come back at KubeCon. Who's your first time here? Maybe you can raise your hand. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> oh, man, that's great. That's great. In the meanwhile, they bring all the audio stuff, so we, we're going to do some quick uh, con conversation. So, well, first of all, welcome. I think that KubeCon is one of the best conferences around. Yes. Not because of just Kubernetes, because of technology and, and community. So, yeah, really happy to hear that. This is the first time that everybody raised their hand. Yeah, it's awesome. Right. Okay. Okay, maybe some question. Who's a FluentD or FluentBet user already? Okay. Now, who's interested in metrics? Okay, <laughs> you already have. Dale. Entonces, esto lo apago ya. Ahí me lo apagaron. Mute. Ahí está, mute. Mute. Okay, so do I get started with that? Yeah, let's get started. Is okay. this working too? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay. So, yeah. Hey, everyone. My name is Anurag. I'm one of the co-founders, maintainers, FluentD, FluentBit project. And, of course, we have Eduardo, creator of the FluentBit project as well. So, yeah, really, when we start looking at FluentBit and FluentD, the way we've, we've begun to think about these projects is really a Swiss, Swiss Army knife for observability. How do we look at all this data, start slicing and dicing it, making it very accessible uh, as part of the ecosystem and how these projects start to fit together kind of in the, in the broader set of the ecosystem, right? Many folks first time at KubeCon, so many projects going around. How do we look at this ecosystem at, at a little bit of a broader level? Right. Yeah. Okay. So one of the important things is like uh, when you are thinking about observability in general, it's because you want to analyze you know, your application, how this stuff is working, right? At the end of the day, managing infrastructure or managing the services that run behind the scenes, you don't want to be worried about that, right? It's like if you're using a Linux system, you don't want to know how GLFC is working, right? You just want to make sure that the application is running, is getting the right resources, memory allocation, everything. And if we go to a higher level from observability, your final goal always will be how do I analyze my data, right? But in order to analyze your data, you need to get the data first, right? In a central place most of the time. And this data that you get come from different sources and from different kind of natures, right? You can think about logs, you can think about metrics, and you can think about traces. And uh, I, I, I guess that most of you are already working in, in some companies, and I'm pretty sure that 99% of you will say, we don't have just one solution for everything, right? You just don't have a MySQL. Maybe you also have PostgreSQL, you have Redis, and your architectures always grow, they always evolve. And all this transition, there are always more components being added. And at some point, it, and from a development perspective, the same thing happens. You will get some applications written in Java, some others in Node.js with JavaScript. So you face this problem that we have different natures or different origins, and in our case, observability, different source of information. And uh, at some point, you will, you will find that you are instrumenting with Prometheus, maybe you're using FluentD, you're using FluentBit, but the goal is always the same. How do I analyze my data? But you have to fix the first problem. So we try to see that uh, and communicate that the Fluent ecosystem, as the name said, is Fluent, it aims not to compete with other projects, even from an um, agent perspective or company perspective, we don't try to compete to be a drop uh, in replacement. We try just to be a solution that can be integrated in your architecture, in your own environment. So no matter what you're running your applications, no matter what you're using for instrumentation at the, instrumentation at the end, you can use Fluent to connect different ecosystems. So and. And our ecosystem has a really interesting thing. The first one, well, everybody knows that it's all fully open source. But one of the things that uh, you might not realize, and you might are facing this in the enterprise, is that sometimes exists with the concept of vendor lock-in. 
because since your goal is to do analysis, it makes sense that you're going to say, oh, I'm going to invest in Splunk, Elastic, OpenSearch. And then they will tell you, these are the tools that you need to do all this data collection, right? But some of them are not real, are open source, but they will tell you, okay, if you use this, you get married to this technology, to this stack. That is a vendor lock-in. Because after one year, when you want to switch, it will be a huge pain. What about if now you think, oh, there's a new fancy database that I want to use, right? What would be the solution? Oh, you, you just don't need to replace the database. You also have to replace all your agents. And that becomes a problem. The Fluent ecosystem try to be to avoid this vendor locking for you. And as I said a couple of times, we are agnostic. No matter what is the product, no matter what is the project or the ecosystem or the tool inside the same CNCF stack, we try to be compatible with all the standards. And um, in the Fluent ecosystem, well, if you're using it, I think that is extra information. Who uses Fluent Bet nowadays? It's standards in Fluent Bet, it's Amazon, Google, Microsoft Azure. When cloud providers choose something, it's because it's production grade. And now a quick recap of the past, present, and future of the Fluent D project and the ecosystem that we have. You know, everything started with Fluent D almost 11 years ago, a solution to collect logs for our ex company to send all the data to the cloud. We made it open source and this project succeeded. The people built around 1,000 plugins. It's a huge ecosystem, right? But it was not just ready uh, for the cloud environments, right? Because Fluent is written in Ruby, it's more heavy. So when you go to deploy this in 100 or 1,000 of machines, right, uh, you know, using 200 megabytes of memory or 400, it's really expensive and CPU intensive in general. At the same time, we started doing some innovation. We come up with the next generation of tool, which was Fluent Bet, part of the same family, but reading in C, optimized for performance, and making sure that it was a really good solution for uh, everybody. But our same philosophy, philosophy, we didn't want to have a drop-in replacement, right? We said that Fluent Bet is going to integrate with Fluent D, or you can use them separately or just independently. And now, one of the trends that we have is that well, since the cloud providers migrated from Fluent D to Fluent Bit, like the default, de facto standard, most of users are following the same pattern. And I would say that nowadays, user does not need a thousand plugins. Most of you might create your own microservices, your own application, and you are just instrumenting by using or sending the data to a custom HTTP endpoint. For example, Fluent D supports like a thousand plugins connect in between connectors, source, and destinations. In Fluent Bit, we support 100. But as of now, I think we have not get any more requirements, right? We support Splunk, Elastic, OpenSearch, HTTP, and many others. And the highlights, well, production grade, high performance. When you run an agent and you see that this agent doing nothing is using 600 kilobytes of memory, means something, right? Of course, when you get more data and you start processing data, you need more memory to handle all that load. And we always try to have to be very low resource consumption. You can write a tool that can process millions of messages per second. Right, but maybe you need a cluster of five machines to process that, right? So we always try to optimize for performance and see how much, how far we can go with Fluentbit. And we have demonstrated that in the last year, we pretty much started doing 4x or 5x times in performance improvements by doing threading, optimizing the core, memory allocations, and so on. And how you can use Fluentbit? There's a couple of distributions. Of course, the, the upstream version is that what most people use. You can get it from Docker Hub. You can get it your packages for Ubuntu, CentOS. We have AWS that they have their own distribution of Fluentbit, which is similar upstream, but the difference is that they, they optimize for their own uh, Amazon services connectors. So they provide different connectors, it's more friendly. So if you're running on AWS and you're a customer, yeah, you can use that one. Caliptia, the company that we founded with Anurag, which is on top of the Fluent ecosystem, we have our own Fluent Bit distribution too. But this is mostly tied for as an LTS version, right? Enterprise ready. So if you're going to run a Fluent Bit and you want to make sure that there's no breaking change for the next 18 months, 
you can use a uh, Calithia for Fluent Bit. And Google Ops Agent, Google created this own agent for their own customers that has two components. It has Fluent Bit for all the log management, and they have a small open telemetry agent for metrics and traces. So they ship this for their own customers. So if you're a Google customer, you can use Google Ops Agent. But at the end of the day, you can do the same with the upstream version, right? So we're not trying to impose what to use. Just go with upstream, and then if you need something more specific, yeah, it's like, uh, do you use vanilla Kubernetes? Do I use OpenShift? You know, it's a matter of personal decision. And yeah, this is FluentBet. Uh, we aim to collect data from different sources and send that data to multiple destinations. We do buffering, retry logic, we back up in the file system in a very optimized uh, way. Now, as a community-based, FluentBet has been deployed and CNCF announced this like one more, more than one billion times in total, right? Uh, we didn't put the fraction here, but this is about order of millions, right? So last year, we pretty much 600 millions, and you can see how the number of deployments today, this year is going. So this is just insane. And this is thanks to the community and people who's here. And actually, most of the features that you see in FluentBet and FluentD is because of the feedback that you provide after these sessions in the conference. Everything, Kubernetes filter, Lua scripting, um, I don't know, Elasticsearch, OpenSearch, all of that. So don't think that you're going to just consume information here. You can also help us to build a roadmap of what will be the future of the project, and that's really important. So um, investments, uh, everybody cares about, oh, this is a program reading in C. Right? Memory safety is an issue. What about languages? It's a common topic. So the only thing that we can do is to making sure that every version gets a most tested every time, more improvement and so on. So we invested a lot on CI CD, regression checks, sanitization, making sure that it's running five, fine on all architectures. Uh, we have a security team working with uh, Google OSS Fastin Technologies. We gotta talk about that in FluentCon, which was our conference this Monday. Pretty much FluentBit is being tested with random input on different interfaces, different functions, and trying to make it crash. Yeah, the first year it crashes like crazy, right? But this has been running 24 by seven for more than one year, and most of these corner cases, these bugs, has been fixed already. And we started solving the logs problem, but we said, ah, we just solve logs, right? And I think that we think that metrics is interesting and there's more problems. So we started extending our scope to metrics and also traces. And this is a question, oh, metrics and traces, but there's all the projects, right? And that's, this is the primary topic of this presentation. So we let Anurag elaborate more about that. Yeah, awesome, thanks Eduardo. And yeah, if I, if I talk about logs, metrics and traces, you know, when, when we talk to the community, what we were finding is folks had a, a bunch of common use cases. So as folks were gathering logs, many times there were metrics in those logs, things they wanted to extract. And what we found was folks were writing gigantic Lua scripts, extracting all these small decimal points from logs, doing all sorts of additions, and then trying to hack it together with Node Exporter or something else and, and, and get into a Prometheus format. And so we took our philosophy of how do we integrate with these ecosystems, makes things easier for, for all our users, and that's really what set us last year on how do we integrate uh, much, much deeper into to a metric sense. Uh, and we'll talk about traces as well. So first, logs, right? This is what we've been doing for, for 11 plus years with Fluent D. When we look at it from a project side, you know, logs are unstructured data. You can have some unstructured logs where someone might write in logger, hi, my name is John, or hello, my name is Jill. We have structured logs, things well known like Nginx access logs or structured schema like uh, uh, syslog. You could have schema list logs. And as you are gathering these logs, you might want to do some processing, right? The most common use case of this is if you are gathering these logs in Kubernetes, you want to enrich them with container, pod, namespace, all of these contextual clues to help you debug and troubleshoot much, much faster. Uh, the same can be said where you might want to reduce that data, right? One of the big use cases that we see from a community perspective is folks who are gathering petabytes and petabytes of data might not want to pay for those petabytes and petabytes of data or send it to perhaps a less expensive 
less used data store so that things can be a, a little bit cheaper. Uh, and that's one of the other big use cases that we see with logs is how do we filter those out, how do we reduce them, or how do we send it to, to multiple locations. And I think metrics are also really fun because when we started FluentBit back in, in 2015, its initial use case was for embedded Linux. And when you're running on embedded Linux, those things are like IoT devices, wind turbines, uh, robots within uh, warehouses. The main information that folks wanted to capture at the time was CPU, memory, thermal, kernel, uh, all, all sorts of metrics uh, from those. And that's what, those are actually the first plugins that Fluentbit had. It didn't have a tail plugin. It couldn't read uh, log files. And so that was something we had way, way back then. And we kept on seeing folks use it. But when we saw those log-based metrics being used last year, uh, we realized, hey, those are not what folks need in, in this new day and age. What the kind of the standard we see is, is Prometheus being used almost everywhere. Um, and, and open metrics being, being that, that compatibility layer. So we went in and made sure that FluentBit can speak the language of those metrics, added counters, gauges, histogram summaries. We created libraries of, uh, called C metrics. It's in the project. You can, you can go and look at it. Uh, and then make these things all exportable. So within all these metrics that we go collect, we're able to export them into, into various formats. And now what we've gone and, and done this year is said, you know, open telemetry is coming with, with a giant wave. Let's go make sure that FluentBit can also speak that and, and be compatible. Uh, so the, the first step we took there was with open telemetry metrics and making sure if you're using the open uh, telemetry metrics SDK, you're collecting those things, uh, we'll be able to collect that and, and send it out. And we have a, a, a small demo that we can show uh, here as well. So what does this look like in actuality? When you look at the Fluent ecosystem, it's really made of all these different plugins, inputs, outputs. Uh, and in the input side, we've added a Prometheus scraper. So you can scrape your custom metrics. Uh, if you're running as a sidecar, so right next to your Kubernetes applications, you can go ahead and grab those uh, metrics. Uh, also mimic node exporter metrics. So you know, we're not doing the full breadth uh, that the Prometheus node exporter team is doing. That's an awesome piece of software, does fantastic things. But there was a lot of commonality with what we had done with our plugins, and we wanted to make sure that we collect you know, 80% of those, give you a good dashboard if you're using things like Grafana or other things to visualize on top. And then from an output side, what are the two main ways to, to get these metrics? The Prometheus exporter, so if you're scraping those metrics, how can I just plug into what already exists? Uh, and also Prometheus Remote Write. So a lot of services these days, whether they're third-party services or uh, projects like M M M3, Thanos, Cortex, uh, I'm sure there's some others, uh, having the ability to just remote write into, in directly into those services. And not being exclusive. So another big thing is like we didn't want to say you must only do remote write with scrape or, or only do node exporter metrics with exporter. Uh, you can kind of choose, combine, send it in three, four different locations, use five exporters if you want, send it to seven places with Prometheus Remote Write, uh, be very flexible in the same way that we are with logs and other data sources. What does this look like from a configuration standpoint? Uh, so the metrics also are, are unique in FluentBit in that our metrics are, don't go through the same pipelines that logs go through. So metrics are almost treated as an independent type. You can, in this configuration example, see, hey, we're collecting node exporter metrics, and then we're outputting them to the port 2021. We could easily add a Prometheus remote write uh, as another output if we'd like as well, uh, add our TLS settings, our service, um, and, and whatever add label tags that we might want uh, as part of that for our dashboard. Yep, Prometheus scraper. This one is actually brand new to uh, Fluentbit 1.9, which was released March of this year. Uh, and this one allows you, just as you would with any scraping, go ahead, grab something, um, get it in the format. In this case, we're using uh, HashiCorp Vault, and then we're using an output to Prometheus Remote Write with uh, additional labels. And with OpenTelemetry, yeah, so si similarly, uh, we started off with HTTP, so input and output. Um, so you're able to ingest with HTTP and output with HTTP. We're looking at additional protocols there. Uh, as OpenTelemetry supports uh, more than just HTTP. Um, and then, on, of course, on top of that, uh, all of the tracing side uh, as part of, part of the roadmap, which we'll, we'll cover here in a bit. 
So what does this look like in actuality uh, when, when we put it all together? So we have a quick demo. Uh, and this is very, very simple. I have a, a JavaScript application. I'm instrumenting it with the standard of the day, which is OpenTelemetry, all the great work that that team's done for building those libraries. We send those uh, via the metric SDK to FluentBit. And then we have Prometheus already in place, so it scrapes that um, via Prometheus scraper. And then we just visualize it with, with Grafana. So let me go ahead and close this out. And let's go ahead and switch into, let's do a couple things. I'm going to go tab by tab here. So first, let's start with the application. So this is my JavaScript application. You can see I'm using, let me go ahead and increase the size here. I'm using the OTLP, Open Telemetry Protocol Metric Exporter, and I'm sending it to FluentBit on its 8080 port. So within FluentBit, I have a read from the HTTP uh, open telemetry, and then I have an exporter, which is that Prometheus exporter that I mentioned earlier. And if I go to the 2021 port, what does it look like if we just viewed it raw? This is really all it is, just a simple counter from open telemetry, test up, down. Uh, then Prometheus, we look at Prometheus and its scrape config. It's grabbing um, from FluentBit on the 2021 port that we were exposing. And finally, come back to Grafana, and how do we visualize all that? So it's a very simple pipeline, uh, something that is you know, very easily replicable, something that we're going to continue to add more and more features to. Uh, but of course, that's what we are here for this conference and, and interested in your feedback uh, on what is needed, what can we add, what can we uh, make sure works really, really well. And especially when we look at some of, the, some of the use cases that has made Fluent successful in the log space with filtering, reducing data, uh, enriching data, how can we bring some of those same uh, ideas to how we're scraping and, and modifying uh, some of these metrics um, from open telemetry and, and open metrics. So with that, let me switch back to the slides here. And let's talk a little bit about roadmap. And the first, first big one is traces, right? So when we look at logs and traces and metrics, uh, because we treat them as independent data sources, one of the, the ideals is how can we start to make some really meaningful correlations or interactions between those pieces of data? And especially uh, when we look at FluentBit and what we've done with logs, we've had uh, some of these notions of stream processing. So you can write SQL today on top of your logs. Uh, common use cases might be, I'm using Nginx access logs. I want to group by error codes with the SQL query, select star from group by error code or response code, um, and then pump out a smaller uh, amount of logs. Similarly, trying to bring some of that logic over to uh, traces, bring some of that logic over to metrics. And in order to do that, we need to introduce the, the same style of, hey, here's a brand new format of, of traces. So our idea is to bring that into Q4 of this year and also extend the, the current open telemetry input output. So instead of you having to say open telemetry metrics or open telemetry uh, traces, have it all live within kind of that same uh, configuration set that you saw before. Uh, then the other biggest one, something that is uh, always continuous is performance improvements. When we look at FluentBit, and, and again, it's, it's success th that we've seen within containerized Kubernetes environments, it's really that high performance, low footprint, uh, and being able to scale that to, you know, we have banks that run on 100,000 servers. We have super small startups that will run this on, you know, the K3S super small micro Kubernetes clusters. So want to make sure that that performance maintains. And uh, to do that, we want to have a better handling of how we treat all these events, because we're not just going to be collecting logs anymore. We'll collect metrics, we'll collect traces, uh, and, and make sure that all of that is async, has a good, um, good, good higher performance. We're also going to be introducing uh, threading support. So we added that on the output side uh, with FluentBit, so you can add more threads. So if you're, for example, sending terabytes of data, uh, you can add this worker setting, which is now the default in 1.9, uh, and, and really pump that data through. And now we're finding the bottleneck coming on the tail side. Uh, when I'm reading that data, if I'm reading a petabyte per day, how do I make sure that I'm reading maybe from 10,000 files or as container density increases, I increase the amount of files that I have on that node. So we're going to be introducing input plugins in a separate thread. 
uh, and of course optimized core operations. So if you're really interested in, in some of these performance improvements, uh, we had a couple talks from FluentCon which are recorded and already on YouTube, things uh, from AWS about improving the event loop, um, also things from, uh, again, the, the folks in the security side who are doing some of the fuzzing and ensuring things are, are compatible and, and well. Uh, developer experience, so again, we know Flumpit is written in C and it might not be the most appetizing thing to go in and try to conquer, uh, but we, we do have Golang interfaces for the output side and we're gonna bring that to the input side as well. Uh, when, when we think of some of those use cases, especially in context of metrics, traces, uh, these can be things like SAS data sources, things that have APIs that have really great Go SDKs for, and you might wanna go scrape that data, collect that data, uh, bring that data in, do some correlations, generate some Prometheus metrics, generate some, some OTEL um, metrics or, or whatnot from. So yeah, that, that experience is coming in Q3. Would love to talk to folks who are interested in, in writing more of those plugins, uh, always interested in, in getting the, the community feedback there. So yeah, you know, in, in this last one, you know, when we think of our, our ideals and how we keep building the project and, uh, alongside the community, uh, you know, with, with uh, Bruce Lee, we think of, you know, be like water, uh, be, be uh, fluent, my friend, be flu uh, fluid. So, yeah, with that, uh, I think we, we have quite a bit of time for, for questions. And with this super packed room, we'd love to, to answer as many as we can. Okay. I'm so oh, oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Lynn, how are you? We, thanks. We, thanks. Uh, yeah. Do we have a mic? Okay. First of all, like, applause for speakers. <laughs> Great job. Amazing, amazing, and uh, yeah, let's say we have a couple of questions actually virtually, so we try to kind of make it a oh, hybrid. Nice. Uh, and yeah, um, who has many, maybe you can start with in-person questions. Anyone has any question? Already have one, okay. Uh, I will try to bring you the mic. Uh, so thank you first. Uh, you mentioned about traces, which sounds great. Uh, I guess my question is, have you, thought about uh, doing it the other way around, which is having Fluent Bits emit is all its own traces so that we can follow the path of our logs and kind of like know that when a log is emitted, it is sent somewhere. And then we would be with distributed traces, uh, be able to know the full path until when the log is uh, sent to the database and how long that takes basically. Yeah. Can you hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, should we handle fluent bit traces, internal information? That's primarily the question. The question. When we talk about traces, uh, traces are hard in general, right? So the way that we are going, we are starting approach right now because this is in development, right? Is not to do traces processing, not do the traces correlation in the agent, because we might need to do buffering, some kind of indexing, but be more complex. So in traces, just to clarify, traces what we're going to do is initially. As of now, take the traces, it's in a row format, and allow send that row traces to destinations and backends that they have all the, the intel to process those traces and correlate them. Kind of Grafana, or there's some cloud services that accomplish that. From internal fluent bit traces, we have not made any decision, but this is really interesting. We might think on how to ship the internal events of fluent bit in a, yeah, yeah, we are shipping the outside information, but we are not. Yeah. Chip in the internal information. So, yeah. so this, I, I'm smiling because you know a few weeks ago in one of our community meetings we talked about this idea of being able to peer into what is a plugin doing, what what, what information is flowing through. So we started a, a discussion uh, on it in in GitHub. Uh, so we'd love participation in there. Try to spec out like what those requirements look like. We have some ideas, uh, but of course uh, there's there's a lot to to go back and forth with security. You don't want people just peering in over a HTTP port of all your logs, right, if they're sensitive. So uh, a, lot, a lot of stuff there, but would love for, for more community feedback and, and what we can do there. Nice, nice. So observability for observability, really. Yeah. Right? <laughs> okay, any other questions in this room? Hi, uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, you said uh, in Q4 uh, you will get traces support. Uh, 
But I think we can right now we can use forwarder plugin, forwarder output for uh, sending traces from the Kubernetes to maybe open telemetry or uh, other places. Uh, will you suggest that? Yeah, will you, will it will be okay or uh, you will suggest that we should wait for uh, Q4 or legit trace support? Yeah, good, good question. Maybe I'll uh, answer a little and then I'll hand it to Eduardo. Um, so, so the question is, hey, should we wait till Q4 or should we use some of the existing integrations that, that already um, are, are there? So to clarify, some of those existing uh, integrations are from Fluent, uh, Fluent D, Fluent Bit using the forward protocol, which is a protocol over message pack over TCP to the hotel collector. And that's a great way. There's, there's some good sessions uh, on that or, or recorded content on that. There's a guide on the hotel documentation on how to do it. Uh, but this is actually uh, different. So this would be receiving the traces to Fluidbit. Uh, so, so, this, so in Q4, you'll be able to receive those traces. If you're using uh, the Fluent Forward protocol via app or via Fluent D or Fluent Bit, you can already integrate with Hotel Collector. Yeah. Great, great, thank you. Okay, any other, maybe last person from the room, we have others as well. Great, let's go. Uh, hi, um, the last time I checked the project, I remember there was no uh, Yocto layer for your project like for Fluentbit, I think there was only a recipe hanging around in the documentation somewhere. So is there a reason why you don't provide your own layer or have you been thinking about it? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned briefly, Fluentbit started as a project for embedded Linux, originally, right? And then we switched the focus to, to the cloud because uh, at that time, embedded faults, there are no standards, right? There was no community around it but in the, in the container space evolved quickly. Now those bitback files from Yocto are there for historical reasons and we aim to support them, but we as maintainers, uh, actually we are so busy with so many requirements that we cannot longer maintain that recipe. It might be broken, we just try to update the version, but if you're using Yocto, you know, bitback files and you can fix it, please submit a PR and I'm happy to get that, you know, process through. Thank There's you. no more reason than that. It's maintained it, yeah. Okay, let's take uh, maybe a few virtual questions. So we have first about um, OTLP. How about adding OTLP support into Fluent Beat in and out? Yeah, that's what we are doing. Actually, where's my camera? Right. Right. So that's I guess <laughs> it's very generic as well, because OTLP <laughs> means also metrics, logs, and yeah. traces. And so there's another question about logging. Okay, so OTLP for us, is more another protocol that we integrate with. We integrate with syslog, forward, um, well, I don't know, we have NQTT, we have a bunch of protocols that we support. So for us, all OTLP is another protocol that we're going to, we're starting supporting right now, initially with metrics, because we were experimenting with metrics. Now the default case is traces, but we're going to do just route traces. In, yeah, so we, we support that already in the input and in the output side. Yeah, we did all the protocol buff conversion to C la layer and that is functional already. What about OTB, OTLP logging? Yeah, we just heard that OTLP, the log spec was just released, but uh, there's not much content that we can add at the moment because of the following. The way that we handle the project and we manage as a community is like we try to optimize for what is the standard in the industry. For example, when we get started with uh, metrics, the first question was, okay, what is the standard for metrics in the industry? And what it is? Prometheus. So we started supporting Prometheus. Then, OT, for example, if I ask you, what is the standard for traces? Open telemetry, right? Now, if I ask today, what is the standard, for example, for, um, well, metric traces for logging? I think that is not standard. Right, OTLP is, is heading into, into that direction. So as soon as uh, this get more traction in the community, we get more use cases, right? We're going to start supporting all these layers. Great, great answer. As essentially it has to organically grow, right? Yeah. yeah. Thank yeah, you. Okay, last question, maybe from the room. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, did you think about having a Fluent Bit as our own input source for metrics? For example, for, for counting logs and putting that into a metric. Yeah, so Fluentbit has uh, 
it has its own way of monitoring today. So you can expose it's exposed over Prometheus that's been there for two, three years um, over a port and it gives you input logs, input bytes, output bytes, great ways to anal like analyze if you're sending data, if you're removing data, um, if how much data you're sending to particular endpoints where you might have a no easy log file. Um, that exists today. We did introduce a few months back Fluent Bit Metrics. It's, a, it's its own plugin that will take those usually exposed over HTTP metrics and ingest them as part of the pipeline. Um, so that, that does exist today. So you could remote write those metrics um, or, or export them to a custom port if you need to. Okay, that's it for, for today. Um, and thank you. We have 20 minutes break. Applause for speakers again. Thank you.